Good morning, everybody. Um, can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, good morning and uh, welcome to the June session of the Philanthropy Club of Illinois. Um, please feel free to use the chat to introduce yourselves. Um, and if your organization has any career opportunities or upcoming events, uh, please share them in the chat. My name is Lisa Villani Gale. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the director of major and plan giving at Chicago Public Media. Um, I also serve as a volunteer moderator for the Philanthropy Club of Illinois. The Philanthropy Club was founded over 20 years ago uh, by Gus Wilhelmi, the co-founder of the Safer Foundation. The club is 100% volunteer driven and our singular goal is to level the playing field for all Illinois nonprofits when it comes to access to funding to support the mission of their organizations and the communities that they serve. We fulfill our goal by providing no cost monthly programming to, to support nonprofits with access to funders and by offering technical skill building to effective fundraising. The Philanthropy Club of, Club of Illinois is, sub, is sponsored by Forefront. You can visit myforefront.org to learn more about their services for Illinois-based nonprofits. Our Forefront staff partner is Key Montgomery, who is currently behind the scenes, ensuring that we have a seamless time, this time of learning this morning. Uh, thank you so much, Key, for all that you do. Um, so uh -huh. this, this morning, we are going to focus on how to tap into your board's fundraising power. Uh, we have with us today, Lucy Kim, the Chief Advancement Officer at Chicago Public Media. Uh, Lucy previously served as the Vice President of Development at the Brookings Institution and the Deputy Vice Dean of Development at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Our other speaker is Chuck Lewis, the Chair of the Lewis Sebring Foundation. Chuck um, is retired from his career as the former Vice Chair of Investment Banking at Merrill Lynch and serves as a board member and Chair of the Development Committee at Chicago Public Media. Lucy and Chuck partner close together to advance major donor strategies at Chicago Public Media. And I'm gonna ask each of them some questions about how they approach this partnership and this work. And there will be plenty of time for your questions as well. So please have them ready. Um, so Chuck and Lucy, could you each um, please introduce yourselves and share a bit more about your background? Lucy, let's start with you. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Great. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure and honor to speak to a group of fellow colleagues who are in the trenches every day doing really important work for our organizations and our communities. Um, as Lisa mentioned, I've had a career in higher ed, in public policy and think tanks, and now in public media. And, you know, and I think people don't really grow up thinking I'm going to be a fundraiser or a director of development, but it is a wonderful career, a career of service and a career that really for me allows me to learn so much about the organizations and the fields um, that those organizations are in. Um, so my background is I'm a, I'm, I'm a child of immigrants. Uh, my family emigrated to the US from South Korea when I was six years old. We landed in a small town, Torrington, Connecticut. And that's where I grew up. Um, I went to the public schools there, had a wonderful education. I studied voice. Um, I wanted to be an opera singer in college and in grad school. And as uh, musicians and creatives often realize when they get out of school and into the real world, it's a pretty hard business. And um, I took a series of other turns in my career and um, landed in philanthropy. And um, I'll tell you a short story, if I may. Um, I was the administrative director of a art, arts nonprofit called the Tanglewood Institute. And the mission was to train the best high school aged classical musicians from across the country and bring them to a summer music program run by the Boston Symphony Orchestra called Tanglewood. And because it's a small nonprofit, I wore many hats, including admissions. And um, also that's where I cut my teeth on working with a board. Um, and this is actually quite apropos because um, the way I got into fundraising was- uh, Hi, how, um, how are you? Oh, Denise, it looks like, uh, oh, there she goes. <laughs> um, and so 
what happened was we were doing a, a national tour um, to audition students from across the country. And there was one, his name is Michael, and he was living in Montgomery, Alabama. And we were, we were auditioning there because we had a board member there. And I remember he had the most incredible tenor voice I had ever heard, just raw talent from top to bottom that just took my breath away. And I knew that I wanted to bring him to the program. So a few weeks later, I'm sitting in my office in Boston and I look at his application and his mom is single mom, three kids working two jobs, making $7,000 a year. And it costs, it cost at the time $6,000 to come to our eight week summer program. So that math doesn't work. And without thinking, without any forethought, I picked up the phone and I called a board member. And I said, Charlie, I need your help. And so I described, he's like, well, what do you want me to do? And I described who Michael was. And I said, well, and in my very artful way, my first solicitation, I said, um, well, can't you just write a check or something? And this was based on my having been to his home, knowing that he's a successful lawyer in town. And I just assumed that he could just write a check and solve the problem. And he, there was just absolute silence on the other line. And I started to panic and I started to talk incessantly. And we all know as fundraisers, you make the ask and you just zip it, right? <laughs> I didn't know that. Um, and eventually he said, well, just, he said, take a breath and tell me about the kid. And so we talked for about five more minutes and he said, well, I'm going to have to think about this. And then I was, we got off the phone. I was terrified. I called my boss because I was sure that I was going to lose my job. And a week later, there was a FedEx envelope on my desk and it was a $10,000 check from Charlie. And he said, I'm giving you more than it costs because I want to make sure that the kid can get get on a plane and fly up to Massachusetts and back. I want to make sure that he has money in his pocket to go have lunch and dinner and ice cream with the kids and not feel like he's on, he's on the outside. And so that was such a life-changing story for me. It put a lot of pieces together for me in my own life as a working class immigrant child, um, I needed scholarships to go to college and to graduate school. And I never really stopped to think that there were people, human beings, generous people behind that money. And the more and more I told my story, people said, well, you know, you could actually do this for a living. It's called development, it's called fundraising. And, and so that really led into this very rewarding 20-year uh, career in fundraising. So I'll stop there. Um, I've taken up a lot of air time so far, but um, I want to hand it over to Chuck, who has um, an incredible story of, of um, service and philanthropy. Thanks, Lucy. I've heard that story before. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a great story. <laughs> Um, so who am I? Um, uh, I went to Amherst College, um, have an MBA from Wharton. I spent 35 years in investment banking at Merrill Lynch. Uh, and it, it, critical to this conversation, I was, um, later on, I, we started using this term, but, uh, but I was a, I had a fancy title, but I was a relationship manager. Uh, which means in investment banking, at least real investment banking, the old the old days, um, you're the middle person between the corporate client and the firm. So you're trying to represent the cor corporate client to the firm and vice versa. Uh, and I had you know, a lot of the typical clients like McDonald's, et cetera, but m most of my practice uh, revolved around uh, uh, younger companies like Federal Express and 
uh, Blackbuster and um, uh, uh, Blackberry, the last ones. Um, and uh, uh, I've served or have served on a number of boards, um, including Amherst, where I'm a life trustee, uh, University of Chicago, Chicago Symphony Orchestra, and Chicago Public Media, to, na to name a few. Um, I co-chaired a $270 million campaign at Amherst. Um, uh, I helped to raise over $100 million uh, for the Urban Education Institute at U Chicago. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, it was mentioned earlier, I'm chair of the development committee at CPM, working closely with Lucy and Lisa. Um, my, my orientation to fundraising, and I've, I talk about it a lot uh, in various settings like this, um, my orientation is to major donors or the what I call the wholesale, wholesale side of the business, uh, not small donors or the re retail side of the business. So much more of what is you know, literally uh, development work, uh, not uh, membership drives or annual funds. So that's a little bit of background. Thank you. Thank you both for sharing. Um, so let's dive into the good stuff. Um, Chuck, you've been involved in fundraising for nonprofits for um, for many decades, as you shared. So why is engaging trustees in fundraising critical to the success of a development program? Why is it so difficult to engage trustees in this process? And why are so few trustees um, genuinely interested in doing this work? Um, yeah, it's apropos that uh, yeah, I've been many decades. Uh, um, I just got back from my 60th uh, reunion at Amherst, which is um, tells you something. Um, and I'm a life tree trustee there, as I think I mentioned, and I've uh, been on the board for 35 years. Um, and um, yeah, I, uh, I have kind of different views on this than many people. Uh, I think every board needs a, uh, a trustee or a director to lead the fundraising um, uh, activity and partnership with the chief advancement officer and, um, and his or her team. Uh, and development committees are, are required for good governance but uh, I, uh, my experience, very few trustees or directors are interested in or capable of helping the uh, CAO and uh, his or her staff. The, uh, the reason for that is, uh, you know, accomplished people who are on boards of directors are used to being uh, on top in a relationship. They're used to being in charge. Uh, and in my view, uh, fundraisers need to be willing to be on the bottom uh, in a relationship. It's a little bit like investment bankers. I've seen investment bankers get in trouble when they uh, uh, when they're interacting with a corporate client and they're making more money than the chief financial officer and they think they're a bigger deal and uh, they forget the fact that the corporate clients on top in that relationship and you're on the bottom and servicing the client um, so i think uh, uh, yeah it, it's it, it's all about um, relationships major donor fundraising um, uh, trustees or or directors of of various institutions, uh, you know, bring relationships to the development uh, effort. Um, they can bring status. They can bring validation. Um, um, what uh, there's one thing that 
has stuck in my mind. I'll steal, steal Lucy Slender here, perhaps. Uh, she uh, introduced me a few months ago to the concept of of a fundraiser needing to be a curious chameleon. Which is a curious chameleon, which is a perfect term. Uh, they need to be curious to begin with, meaning when they're talking with a, a client, with a prospect or a donor, they need to be interested in the donor. Uh, they need to be asking questions. They don't need to, they shouldn't be launching into some pitch. I hate the word, by the way, but they shouldn't be la launching into some speech about the, the organization, but they should be finding out about the person. They're trying to further the relationship. Um, at the same time, and, and, and as I mentioned earlier, I think very few people are, are um, situated to do this work. Um, I'm uh, repeatedly struck by the fact I'll encounter people in all sorts of settings, like you know, take my reunion I just went to. Um, uh, very few people ask you a lot about you. They're going to tell you about themselves, but they, they're not, they don't display a curiosity about you. Uh, so that's the curious part. The chameleon part is um, that you need to, um, I think anybody building relationships or maintaining them, need to you know uh, need to try to get on the same page as the other person that's the chameleon part you you you, you um, you're trying to to get on their wavelength uh, the, the 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 holy grail for me in the investment banking business was when i'd have a a, a deep enough relationship with a a CEO or a CFO, a company or a treasurer, uh, and they would say later on in the relationship, well, I've never, ever, never told anybody else this, but, and they would open up to me. Um, and that's the chameleon part of getting on the same wavelength with them. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Chuck. Um, Lucy, we'll go back to you. So can you tell us what your experience has been like partnering with board and committee members on prospect work and give an example of how a volunteer has played an important role in closing a gift? Sure, happy to. And, you know, I want to build on Chuck's point because I think it's so important, the, the curious chameleon. Um, I think it's that. And Chuck also mentioned the word or the term relationship manager. And I think that's why we do our work because there is there is a transactional side of fundraising and that's really important, right? If you think about how we really need to diversify our revenue streams within fundraising, you've got the annual fund or here we at, at um, Chicago Public Media, we have members, 80,000 members who are giving us small gifts, um, but in major gifts and principal giving, really the giving is predicated on relationships and trust. And so I really try to get to know our board members on a one-on-one -on -one level. I would say that I probably spent the first three months of my job scheduling one-on-ones with every single board member and really to get to know them as humans and, and understand, as I think we all try to do, which is what makes them tick. And then I'm also have have my hat, my scouting hat on because I'm scouting for talent. I'm scouting to understand, is this person a great networker? You know, is this the type of person? And, you know, we all know the, the cues and clues to look for, right? If they're telling you they went to dinner at the economics club one night and they're on this other board and they went to a board meeting last week and, and you kind of get the sense of, you know, they they like to be engaged, they like to be involved, they probably have a big network. 
those are really important things to know. Um, other people are less out on the front, you know, less less visible that way, um, but are more, you know, could be really fantastic worker bees for you. Um, you know, maybe they don't want to be uh, out on the forefront, but they're willing to write emails. They're willing to do other things. And I think really trying to figure out um, what that, do that mapping of talent within your board. And I'm also very direct about asking questions and, and saying that development is a team sport. Um, and, you know, none of us raises a gift on our own. It's our work is very interdependent. And would you be willing to help us? And that, you know, people, I think, respond to that kind of directness well. And and some will run for the hills and say, no, I don't want to do this. This is not my cup of tea. And you then you know, right? You, you know that, um, you know, they might be a great board member in other respects, but fundraising is not for them. Um, and then others, you find out that, you know, they... They love making the ask. Others are more interested in just making introductions and then stepping away. Other people want to thank donors. You know, they really get a lot of satisfaction out of uh, out of expressing gratitude, um, but they don't want to make the ask. Um, so, you know, I think really trying to figure out where each board member stands on this topic and in this work is really important for all of us. And I, I call development work with board members a coalition of the willing. You know, you never want to ask someone to do something if they don't feel that they're equipped to do it or they're uncomfortable doing it. Um, now, having said that, you know, I've worked with board members who've said, well, I've never done this before, but I want to help. Um, and and I feel like those, you know, those folks are wonderful because you can really enter into a coaching relationship with them. And, and then they feel really good about their own aptitude as they get better and better um, in the work. And in the meantime, you're really building, again, your relationship and your trust with them. Um, in terms of an example, there was one organization that I worked at where I came in and the president um, told me very clearly, you know, I'm not a fundraiser. Um, I haven't done fundraising before. And and he said, you're going to have to teach me. And, you know, and what I did was I, I scoured the data. I looked at our all of our um, reporting on our top donors historically. And I, you know, every time we met every week, I would spend probably about 30 minutes saying, okay, today we're going to walk through these three donors, who they are and what I understand about why they support us and who they're connected to. So early on, probably in the first two months, I there was a name who is a major, major national philanthropist sitting on our board, may, had made a $2 million uh, gift in the previous campaign, but had the capacity to do a lot more. And so I started asking questions about, you know, because the, pres the president of the organization had preceded me by about two years. So he'd been there for about two years. And I, I, I said, you know, what's your relationship like with him? And he's like, well, you know, when I got here, your predecessor told me that, you know, he, the donor told him he's not doing anything beyond the two million. And so, you know, they told me that, you know, like, I you know, obviously I'm going to, say hi to him and, and talk to him at board meetings, but I really shouldn't waste my time. And and I said, you know, I have a, a different point of view. Um, first of all, two million isn't just chump change. Um, and secondly, this is a person who is used to having an audience with the leaders of every organization that he's associated with. And we need to pay him the respect of giving him that time and giving him that access to you. And so the next time he flew in for a board meeting, I had arranged for the president and this donor, just the two of them, to have dinner together. 
And my president was nervous. He, he, he said, I don't know. I, I don't know that we have anything in common. And, and I said, listen, you're a great conversationalist. Um, talk about your background, but ask him questions. You know, getting back to Chuck's notion of curiosity, ask him questions. Ask him about his life. He's led a fascinating life. Well, he texts me that night at 11 o'clock. They had been at dinner from 6 p.m. till 1030 together, hit it off, had a wonderful time. And then the donor invited him to go fly fishing with him um, down in Bermuda. <laughs> um, and that was the start of a really beautiful friendship. And then a year and a half later, there was an opportunity in the organization to fund something new that we know this donor had a passion for. And so I talked to my president and he said, yes, I think we should go for it. We should, and we should put a big number out there um, to name this center. Um, and it was $15 million. And so I asked him, I said, you know, who do we know who knows this donor within our network? And so we were mapping relationships and we figured out that he had close relationships with two of our board members, including our board chair, very close personal relationship. And he also had a very close relationship with one of the faculty members um, for the research center. And so I called a meeting and we got ourselves in a room and we talked about putting this ask in front of the donor. We asked. We, I asked a lot of questions about how people know this person. Are we making the right ask? What is, you know, how does this donor like to be approached? And then we came up with a sequencing of who's going to test the waters with him first. Um, then I and my team would be ready with a proposal that we would put in front of him, who was going to follow up with him. Um, and then who should be um, making the, the formal ask in front of him? And so we teed this up that our board chair was going to soften the ground and test the waters with him first and ask if he, if he do, would be willing to review a proposal. And then we decided that um, our president should make the formal ask um, face to face and that then the um, the faculty member would be with our president so they could really get into the weeds and he could ask a lot of questions and we'd have our ducks in a row in that regard. Then the board chair would follow up again after that call. And then from there, so that was our, our kind of one, two, three, you know, moves one, two, and three, four. Um, and then we would, see, we would regroup and figure out where we were. And and it, you know, and it worked. It took time because he's a very busy person. So it ended up taking about, you know, a month and a half to get all of these conversations set up. Um, but it worked. And what we did was we made sure, you know, I was kind of at the, I was the invisible hand as fundraisers often are. Um, and, you know, following up with each person, having the conversation, getting that intel then back to the rest of the group that would then shape the next conversation and so on and so forth. So that's an example of, you know, again, coalition of the willing and figuring out the right, right people uh, to bring into a solicitation. Uh, that's a great story, Lucy. Thank you. Um, all right, Chuck, we're going to go back to you. Um, can you talk a more about your um, general philosophy for your role as a partner to the development staff? Yeah, I thought that, yeah, that is a, a perfect story, Lucy. Um, the, um, yep, I, I do some sessions like this. Uh, for uh, one of my uh, former uh, professional development partners. Uh, he teaches a class uh, to mid-career professionals. And, uh, and I always make the point, and they, a lot of the conversations about getting trustees or directors involved in, in fundraising. 
and uh, and develop and development work. And I always uh, am pretty um, um, blunt about the fact that very few people are are made for doing this. Uh, they may do, as Lucy said, may do other behind the scenes kinds of things, but but to actually participate in what Lucy just described, there are very few people who are um, either capable or willing. Uh, Lucy's story also points out that when you're talking about you know, real development work, you know, big ticket development work, that um, uh, it takes time, it takes uh, looking for other resources like the other people involved. Uh, it's very handmade. And uh, so all those points are, are very well taken. My, um, uh, my general philosophy is, as in my role as a partner to staff, um, my two most memorable roles uh, uh, have been at Amherst and U Chicago. Um, and um, I had one frontline fundraising raising partner in each of them, um, the uh, John Pistol at Amherst and Tom Wick at U Chicago. So you may know Tom Wick, who's, who's now at Rush. Um, they were the professionals who drove the process. I relied upon them to, um, you know, take takes the initiative, keep pushing things, keep me organized, remind me when I needed to do things, uh, just making the trains run on time. And uh, um, and I brought to to the situation. I brought knowledge how to do relationships uh i i brought some of my relationships to the uh or the um, um you know having uh um, you know peer-to-peer -peer helps a lot um and um uh, so i have the i have the uh you know I, I don't know if you know tom wick anybody but um, you know, he is not a uh, kind of you know predictable, you know, from central casting fundraiser. Um, you know, he's not you know big personality. He's uh, uh, you know, he's not what what most people would expect. But he's fabulous because he. Uh, <laughs> He was a lineman in college, and he uh, he's just really great at the blocking and tackling. So he and I have very different personalities, uh, but but uh, but we complement each other. And he kept kept the, the uh, continuity of the of a particular situation going. He he uh, uh, was on top of the information about the organization uh, he just kind of you know helped to kind of manage me uh, he kind of relationship manage me uh, and I so I look for when I'm looking when I'm working with um, uh, and I, and I, I think of the frontline fundraisers like at Chicago Public Media I think of them as relationship managers you know, they're the relationship managers and, and we're there to to help um, um, enhance those relationships. So those are some of the ideas. Thank you. Um, so Lucy, uh, you told us a great story about a willing participant um, who just needed a little coaching and encouragement. But I think everyone on this call knows that you don't always get a willing participant. Sometimes uh, folks are a little more hesitant and um, sometimes the person you really need um, to help is more hesitant. Um, so can you tell us about a time when a board member was hesitant to solicit one of their contacts and um, what happened and how did you overcome it? Or so, yes, I faced a lot of folks who really are uncomfortable making the ask. 
And, but if they're, so I would say that if they're really uncomfortable, then it's, you know, I try to ask questions without pushing about whether they would want to be involved in some way, but not making the ask, or if they just would like to step away altogether. And I think that's, you know, the, those are, when we hear no, right, I, for fundraisers, right, it's, um, no is hardly ever a no. It's maybe not exactly the way you presented it. Maybe it's not yet or not now. So I think asking some of those questions to understand, you know, where the speed bumps are is helpful. So there was one board member that I worked with where she did have the closest relationship. She was the most influential. Um, it The relationship with, with the donor was born out of a years long friendship. And I think that can sometimes be complicated for folks, right? They don't wanna mix business with pleasure. They feel that they don't want to put their friend in an uncomfortable position. And so then for me, it's, you know, for me, it was about let's get back to why we want to approach this person. So it's then not about their relationship, but it's about why we're making the ask in the first place. And I think when we discussed it in that way, it was the board partner who said, oh, yeah, she loves this organization. She's devoted to the cause. And so really starting from there to say, you know, let's even let's just put aside who's going to make the ask. But, you know, how would you guide me in like, how do you think we could make this person most comfortable um, in in receiving an ask and and really see that person as as a resource um, and 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 to try to learn. Um, how to proceed in the solicitation um, and then really save the who's gonna who's going to actually say the words to the end and say you know okay now now that we've really gone through this step by step I, I have a better sense from you and how you think we should approach this what we should say who should say it is the next thing that we need to figure out and so with this person, she said, you know, I think I wouldn't mind being in the room and for us to, for me to be helpful in reminding her why this organization is important to her, why it's a, why it's a shared passion of ours, how it strengthened our relationship. Um, she said, but I'm not going to say the number. And so I said, do you think you'd be okay if I were in the room with you? And I set the number and ultimately she was fine with that configuration. But, you know, it took a couple of conversations for us to get there. Um, you know, there have been other situations where the person has just absolutely drawn a red line and said, no way, like, I don't want to be a part of it. I don't want, <clears throat> I don't want to make the ask. Um, and and there, I think also you just try to say, well, could you like, would you mind just completely on the down low for us to have a conversation? Because I'd love to get your advice. And, and that's gold too, right? Because they have special insights that we may not have as fundraisers and to learn as much as you can with someone who's got a close relationship. And then you, and then I think you also engage them to say, okay totally understand you don't want to make the ask who do you think we should go to you know who do you think would be the mo most persuasive spokesperson um ambassador for the organization and you know in those instances right then you're really brainstorming with them and then they feel good about having helped because you know my sense is with um, board members like no one wants to feel that they just shut you down and said no and I think it's part of our job if when people do say no to say, well, can we can you help me in another way? Um, and that's that's part of, again, the, the relationship building and the trust building there. Yeah, let me let me add some things to that, if I could. The. Uh, yeah. Um, 
in my investment banking life, uh, I seldom asked for an order. People think the investment bankers are these kind of wheeler dealer, aggressive guys or gals, and and uh, uh, but my what I would do is I would uh, uh, really get close to a large number of people at certain companies, um, and I would. Uh, get to know the company and the people so well that their needs would become apparent. And then if if we're talking about their needs, then, you know, and I've got, um, you know, I've developed these deep relationships with these people. It's just kind of natural that we would, would do the deal. Um, and so I, I look at it for for uh, institutions, I, I think that's also the the ideal that um, you know there's the old saw, a little, like, little hyperbolic, but you know your your uh, your best prospect is your most recent donor. So you, you, know, you and, and another another one is that um, say in the in the higher ed world. Um, you know the the uh, the maximum gift they give is probably 25 years after their first gift uh, for all sorts of reasons. So it's the idea that that you you actually have a relationship which keeps on giving, um, and um, and that's very much the way I I approach things, um, and um, uh, and and. I think you, um, the, 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 the development activity, um, needs to be, you know, trying to raise, uh, you know, truly major gifts, uh, so that you can actually spend time, uh, on developing or ongoing relationships with people. Um, that if the gifts are too small, the returns too low, and so you can't spend all this time um, uh, developing the relationships and maintaining the relationships, and then and then uh, seeking to uh, to uh, you know get the the donor to continue to to uh, increase their gifts. Um, the um, so the, and, and as Lucy is saying, I, I think these things are uh, very handmade. Each situation is different, uh, and uh, they're not formulaic. Um, and um, I think that's a key part of this this whole process. Thank you. Um, all right, everybody. I'm going to ask. Chuck and Lucy, one more question that they'll both answer, and then we are going to allot the rest of the time for Q and A. So, um, you can start asking, posting your questions in the chat, or um, you can uh, get your question ready and raise your hand um, during the Q and A. So, our last question, my last question for you is: um, There are uh, something that I personally experience with this board partner work is that it can be monotonous. It takes a really long time. Um, and uh, so it's easy to kind of get lost in the details. Can you share some practical tips and strategies or even do's and don'ts that help to systematize board partner work and keep it on track? Um, Lucy, let's start with you. Sure, I think the most important thing to remember is that board members are volunteering their time. And it's our job as staff to make it as easy of a lift as possible. And so at Chicago Public Media, when I first arrived, we did not have an infrastructure um, for supporting our board partners. And so what I did was assigned one person to really be the central depository or the, the hub, if you will, the nerve center of the work, working with me, working with our relationship managers, our fundraisers, and then also communicating 
to our board partners. And it's really important to have one person manage the communications, manage the flow, track the work, right? Because you want your fundraisers to be external as much as possible. Um, and so you don't want them to get bogged down in, you know, writing emails or 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 tracking the work themselves. Um, so I think if you have the bandwidth on your team to assign one owner to really own that work, to provide that service to your board partners, that's really important. And, and that's everything from, you know, the things that we don't even think about, right? Which is like putting lists together of names and doing list reviews, um, then putting all of that into some kind of central tracker that we can all look at, Make, making sure that we're logging every move that we have agreed on with the board partner. Now, central to this also is making sure that the board partner has a relationship with the board, um, with the with the fundraiser. And that's something that Chuck has really modeled for us, which is, you know, Chuck doesn't want to go through layers, right? Chuck wants to talk to the relationship manager directly because that person is the most knowledgeable about the donor or the prospect. And so he'll just pick up the phone and call them. And that's been great for our fundraisers to be able to talk to the board member who's working on, you know, working together with them directly. So I think it's it's a really win-win. Um, but I, I think organizing, professionalizing the work within our shops is is really important. Um, Chuck, uh, anything else you'd like to throw in there? You'll hear you'll hear familiar themes. Uh, I think the for me doing this work starts with with two categories of information. One is what I call the list, capital T, capital L, and the other is the story, capital T, capital S. So the list starts with. Um, who are your existing donors? Um, uh, understanding them best, not always looking for fresh faces, but taking care of the people you already have. Uh, deepening those relationships, trying to move them up in size. Um, I am I'm, uh, extraordinarily. This goes. This goes back to. I'm, I'm extraordinarily contacts oriented. Uh, yeah, on your on my phone, uh, and I think I've got five thousand contacts on my phone. So every time I talk to somebody, uh, regardless of whether it's a a fundraising situation, and I learn something about them, I jot notes down on my phone. So some of my contacts will be in, in some of the entries in the contacts will be three, four, five pages long. Uh, and I do that because I'm, I'm curious. I'm, uh, another word for it, and this really applies to me, is I'm nosy. <laughs> really, really, really want to know about people. It's, I find it interesting, but it's also very useful. Um, and so, so the whole idea of developing a list and, uh, and then populating it and deepening it and any Anytime somebody around the organization, uh, including the frontline funder, the, the RM, the frontline fundraiser, or the trustee or whatever, uh, learns something, you put it in the files. Uh, and so that's, that's a key part of it. And it's a, it's a mentality. It's a, it's a relationship mentality. I do it because I find it interesting, but it's also, you know, knowing facts about people permit you to recall things that you've done together or things you have in common. Um, uh, all, all manner of things that deepen relationships. The, the, the story part is um, critical and a lot of people I kind of I hate case statements. 
case statements in, in uh, campaigns, uh, you know, glossy and necessary, I guess, and, and kind of things to leave behind. But what you really need to do um, in working, you know, lay people like myself needing to work with the professionals is to get to the essence of what what the organization's all about, um, um, and um, why is why is what what are the reasons to support this organization? Um, I, 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 one key phrase I've long used, I think I picked this up from some academic work years ago, uh, that major donors give to organizations they're proud proud to be associated with whole notion of pride of association and part of the part of the job of an RM and their board partners um, is to remind people why they should be proud of the place um, and the, the, you know, I, when I when I talk about that key concept of pride of association uh, I always quickly uh, talk about Lucy's former employer Harvard. And people say, why can Harvard continue to raise gobs of money when they have such a giant endowment? It's pretty clear to me, because people like being associated with Harvard University. Uh, so that that whole mentality, I think, is is really key. So the two things, the list and the story are, are uh, very important in this work. I was waiting for you to bring up the list and the story, Chuck. Um, I think that's a great illustration, though, um, and such an important reminder for us fundraisers. Thank you. All right, so we have one. Um, our first question is from Eric, and it has eight thumbs up in the chat, which means a lot of people are into this question. So we'll start with here with this. Um, Eric says, both Ms. Kim and Ms. Mr. Lewis have shared some great examples from their experience in the development world. I would love to hear their thoughts on building a culture of philanthropy with a board that is not a fundraising board, avoids fundraising, and is very program focused. Who wants to start? <laughs> Do you want to go first? Yeah, I think um, it's like I said at the top um, that very few people in all walks of life uh, are at all interested in fundraising or capable of doing it. Uh, so just so so like Lucy said, at one point, um, you're, you're searching for talent. Um, and, um, and you, you, you know, you, you look at you're looking for, for people who have, you know, who would fit the curious chameleon category. Um, and very few people do. Um, so, first point is don't expect a lot of board members to get it or want to be involved. Just that's just the facts. There'll be a very small minority, and look for that small minority and involve them. Um, the um, not sure. I'm not sure about the have to think about a fun fundraising culture uh, uh, I, I think if I think that that I for one object to um, imposing a board uh, of people who are primarily big donors uh, I find those boards boring and uh, and they're not they don't really attract people to this board. So I'll give you an example. So the 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 Amherst College Board is, in my view, an ideal board. Um, was for years uh, twenty one people, uh, including the president. Now we've increased it to twenty five people, including the president. And uh, and it's a very strong culture. Um, uh, uh, virtually all the members are alumni, uh, and uh, 
but the board is board itself is very carefully composed. So it's not just a bunch of wealthy rich people. You know, we I always say we we every cycle we we have the requisite billionaire, um, and we've got a bunch of other people with deep pockets. But um, you know, then we have you know academics and and uh, people involved in politics and you know, all sorts of you know, authors and uh, people who are interesting. They bring a real real uh, uh, depth to the board, uh, and 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 therefore people clamor to be on this board. Uh, and they're and they're and very high standards, so very heavily engaged. So it's not what I call a drive-by board. It's a hands-on board. To the point, to, to make the point, uh, at Amherst, uh, all board members have to be at every meeting. And if you miss a meeting, you need a note from your mother. Uh, and uh, I think that's that's the idea. I serve on a lot of boards where one board I served on for 10 years, a high pollutant board, um, uh, 55 members, a very wealth-driven board, and in that 10 years, there were a handful of board of trustees I never saw. That's the that's the drive-by board. Kind of board. So I'll stop there. I think this is such an interesting topic, and I've served. Um, with organizations that had many different board configurations. Um, and I agree with you, Chuck. I think um, a board composed purely of very high-end donors is not a, you know, necessarily a very interesting board. And you do want variety. I, but I think what's really important is for the, the CEO of the organization and the executive leadership team to really figure out what is your purpose for your board is it does it have fiduciary responsibility is it more of an advisory board now we all know as fundraisers that board engagement is one of the really important pathways and one of the most important tools we have as fundraisers to raise the folks who have the the really high capacity to give to raise their sites, right, and to get them invested, have some skin in the game in your organization. So I think figuring out, and we've done a lot of this work with our governance committee of our board, of what is the right mix. I think that's really important to know from an organizational perspective what you need from your board, and then you might decide, you know, we need more fundraising firepower, whether it's board partners who can work with the board. Um, and then you think about, well, then do you create a development committee, like the, the committee that Chuck is 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 heading for us? Um, and even, you know, Chuck and I have been having conversations about how do we kind of loosen the strictures of a development committee and bring in more people from across the board who are willing to do this work with us, but maybe sitting on other committees that prevents them from being on the development committee. We would, you know, because that's a kind of a silly barrier to say, well, you serve on this board or this committee, you can't serve on our committee, so you can't do development work. You know, that's that that helps no one. Um, so, you know, we're talking about how do we how do we think about this in a more liberal way um, to again broaden that coalition of the willing. Um, so, I think you know, understanding the purpose and if fundraising, if raising money um, and having those deep pocketed donors is important for your board to figure out how do you make that work within your current structure? Um, you know, do you have a development committee or some places just have different donor groups that you can form that's outside of the board, but it's, you know, it's elevated. For example, at Chicago Public Media, we created a business leadership council. And that was very philanthropically driven. Um, it really served two purposes. One is we wanted more visibility among corporate and civic leaders across Chicago about who we are and what we do and why we're important. And we also 
saw that this was a huge philanthropic opportunity because these leaders tend to be generous and tend to have capacity to give. So we created a separate pathway to get involved with us that's not necessarily being on the board. So I would say also, you know, look outside your board too, to engage, to really enlarge your tent of supporters, number one. Number two, in terms of building a culture of philanthropy, the one common denominator for me is that I think every single board member should be making a philanthropic gift within their capacity, right? And so someone may be able to make a million dollar gift and someone, their capacity may dictate that they can make a thousand dollar gift and that's okay. But I think for us as fundraisers to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with each board member to say, you know, philanthropy is so important for us as a nonprofit about to support what we do. You know, could you see yourself making a gift if they're not already? Or if you understand what their capacity is and they're not giving to their capacity to say, you know, we would be honored to earn your, uh, earn, earn your support at a higher level. You know, what would that take? What would you want, um, you know, in terms of learning more about our, uh, our organization or, um, you know, and really just being direct about that conversation. What I've learned in the organizations that I've served in is there's often a reluctance to talk about money in a forthright way with the board. And I think, I think that's, we're not doing our jobs if we're not having those conversations. And that's not to say that, you know, we're, we're trying to nickel and dime people and we're trying to eke out every cent. You know, it, I think it's about giving our board members another pathway to help the organization um, through, you know, we, we often hear the, the, the term, you know, gifts of talent, time and treasure. And I think that's right. And we need to tap the treasure part as well as the talent and the time. Um, and again, you know, it's it's about what can someone give? What is their capacity to give? And asking them to make your organization one of their top philanthropic priorities. And the ceiling will be different for everybody. So that's how I think about it. I think everyone should be giving. And I think, again, the one-on-one -on -one conversations um, will hopefully reveal to you with good questions, you know, whether someone would want to join and help fundraise for your organization. Um, yes, very much agree. Thank you. Um, so Anya asks, um, on this line, can you talk about leveraging board networks for institutional fundraising? I, in Foundation Relations, find this difficult since our CDO and major gift officers staff our board members, so I don't know the details of their networks, but I know that board members could introduce us to new institutional funders. List reviews of foundations have not been successful with our board members, even though we know they have relationships with individuals on those foundation boards, for example. Um, I'll also... Um, this is a great question, Anya, and I'm going to pass it over to Lucy and Chuck to answer it, but I also want to um, just raise the topic of corporate giving here, too, as part of institutional um, funding, because um, that is one goal of our Business Leadership Council is to raise our, um, increase our corporate giving um, engagement. Um, all right, Lucy, Chuck, who wants to start with this question, how to increase board engagement um, with uh, potential institutional partners? Do you want me to take a stab? Please. <laughs> Just not to sound like a broken record, but I think it, it does come down again to relationships oh, and relationship mapping. Um, you know, Anya, I'd love to learn more about, you said it hasn't been, list reviews haven't been successful, um, just to help you problem solve a little. Oh. Sorry, I was muted. Yeah, you were just muted for a second. You said problem okay. solve a little and then we lost your audio. Oh, okay. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I'd love to understand what the obstacles have been. Um, you said that list reviews haven't been successful. 
Um, it sounds like the board relationships are really with your CEO and, and the CDO. Um, what were the obstacles you ran into with the list reviews? I don't know if I can unmute myself. I keep getting muted, but we can um, hear you. Great. Uh, so, you know, it, providing a list of foundations isn't helpful because saying, you know, Polk Brothers Foundation or Steen's Family Foundation, well, those are a little bit more specific, but MacArthur Foundation, you know, that doesn't mean anything to a board member. And I have learned that lesson. But, but then pulling like the whole list of who's on the MacArthur Foundation's board, certainly we know that there are relationships in our board where they know those individuals, but doing that for even five foundations, you know, 10 to 15 board members of each of those foundations, our, our CDO doesn't want to bring that kind of list to our board members uh, because it's too long and it's not, um, you know, it's, it's too time intensive, right? So what's the, what's the better way to get them to, to find those connect connections within their networks? I have a thought. Um, is there a way to tailor like a shorter list, like do the, the work of the relationship mapping and then say to ex board member, um, here's a list of five people who are on boards of foundations we're trying to engage. What are your relationships like? Is that an option? Yeah, but I think that, um, so I, you know, I spent 35 years on the investment banking side and in the last 20 years full time working on our own family foundation. Um, and uh, so I live in, you know, I'm kind of, constantly on both sides of the table, you know, fundraising side and a funding side, which is, you know, is uh, useful and informative. Um, and, um, and I, I'm not so sure about uh, list reviews. Um, I, 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 I doubt that, um, you know, uh, relationships with board members of MacArthur um, does any good. The uh, uh, MacArthur and, and uh, you know institutionalized foundations like MacArthur versus uh, I'll just I'll be blunt what I usually do don't I hope I don't offend anybody uh, but I, I I call them I call MacArthur et cetera dead people's foundations and I call the, uh, the you know family foundations and other places including the crowns uh, where there's the uh, the sources of the money are still alive. Those are very different things. Um, and uh, but but um, you know the, the the people who are critical on in foundations are the program officers. If they if they are institutionalized to to uh, to uh, uh, have program officers, or uh, in our case, uh, you know it's basically. Uh, uh, our, our daughter who works full time with me and and uh, and my wife um, and we've got a couple other family members who are not very not very involved. Uh, so ours is a much more personal thing, and it's our money, not not hired staff uh, 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 distributing other people's money. Um, uh, so it would be in, in in the in the big institutionalized foundations. Uh, the program officers, the key people to get to them. Uh, and board members typically won't be very effective. You know, Chuck makes a really important distinction for the, the bigger institutionalized foundations. It is, as you know, the pathway is often through the, the program officer. Um, I mean, I think if you're facing resistance, one thing to do building off of Lisa's idea is to do some of the relationship mapping on your own and that's it's time. But you know, if a, a, a lot of these uh, foundations do have their boards on their websites. Um, and if you, first of all, I would say, start to do some rela relationship mapping of your board members. Um, what boards are they on? Um, and then you can then that's that's a very 
that's a simpler ask to say, you know, Chuck, I know that you serve on the U Chicago board. I'm trying to get to this person. Then Chuck is, then I'm much more directed about my ask. Um, you know, I, I do think, you know, we use, we do list re reviews a lot at CPM. Um, but that's because I hold, you know, I, I, you know, I have good relationships with board members and, you know, and I, I, you know, I think it's a useful tool, but there are ways where you can be much more surgical, I think, um, if you're wanting to be sure that you're not asking for too much time, but it then it would require time on your end to do that homework ahead of time. Thank you. Um, so, Sorry, I'm scrolling back up to the question I wanted to get to next. Um, Joshua asks, how might any of your recommendations shift for organizations that are part of a national organization so the local board is an advisory board rather than a governing board? I would, I think, you know, <laughs> the pr same principles apply um that hopefully you know your local advisory board members who can then be influential to the national board i know different organizations have different structures and relationships to the national board um you know i'd want to understand who runs the national board are there any people from my city my community my region on that national board that I can get to know, um, you know, again, trying to like just find those, navigate those pathways to influencers, both locally and nationally. Yeah, I think of uh, an example would be Teach for America, uh, which is all over the country. I don't even know where they're headquartered. I'm not, and I think that's probably very dispersed these days. In the, remote working world, but um, but Teach for America, Chicago, maybe Northwest Indiana or something, uh, but Teach for America here has a strong uh, local identity. And uh, and it's almost like it's a standalone. Uh, uh, I, 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 I don't have many relationships with, as a funder, with organizations that you know, are national in scope and they happen to have a, a local uh, other than somebody like TFA, which has 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 because of its its local leader, the, the quality of its local uh, board leadership uh, uh, has been able to really uh, uh, create an identity that's local. Um, uh, the, the kind of the branches I'll take the YMCA in Evanston. I live in Evanston. So I'm with all YMCA in Evanston as part of the, the YMCA network. I don't think I'm that way at all. I think it was our YMCA. Uh, and we're big back, big funders of it. Um, the, uh, don't even know I take on it. I, I, I don't. Frank, as a funder, I frankly don't have much interest in, in uh, things or branches that are not deeply seated in our communities. Thank you. Um, question from Melanie. Um, Melanie says, I struggle with my development committee in several ways, one of which is how to differentiate between major gift work and then in parentheses, bringing our major gift campaign to a conclusion. That's what she means by major gift work and our regular fundraising, such as our year end appeal. Very few take initiative without significant nudging. Um, what do we think? Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I was talking about before that I think they're, you know, at, at the CAO level, they come together, right? So that, that Lucy has to be worried about the development side uh, as responsible for development side and membership drives. The membership drives your like annual funds um, and uh, they're very different animals uh, and I for one am only interested in the development side 
uh, and uh, uh, and then there'll be other people, like at colleges, you'll you'll find people who are uh, just went to this reunion, and there'll be people who have for years you know d done work with the the annual fund at the college. That's a different beast. It's a more mechanical thing. It's a more large numbers thing. Uh, where the uh, uh, the development work at the college is a small number, uh, very handmade. Uh, I said different different activities. Lucy, what do you? Yeah, uh, I I guess I'm curious um, if you're willing to come off of mute. Um, I'd love to hear more because typically we do involve board members more on the development side. Having said that, we've started a, a thank you calling program for all of our major donors, and we've got some folks on our development team or development committee, um, you know, who are giving at the lower side of the ledger, and they love making these calls. They will just, they will just, you know, call one person after another, happy to leave voicemails. It gives them a ton of satisfaction and it's work that we need them to do. So I think really trying to, what we did was try to figure out, okay, how do we engage folks? Because there is a thing in development, right? Where you want, Chuck mentioned the word peers. You want people who are giving at similar levels to, to coexist, to have that relationship and to make the asks. It's more powerful when someone who's giving around the level that you're already giving is making the ask. And so we're trying to find parity as much as we can. It's not always possible, um, but there are folks who maybe can't give $100,000 or $50,000, um, but they still want to help. And so, you know, this was, was a way our, our staff really figured out, you know, it'd be awesome if we, in this very digital age when people are getting emails or, you know, it's social media, for someone to just get an old fashioned phone call or or a, a voicemail, just saying thank you. You know, and we talk about this, you know, Lisa knows in our team a lot, which is how can we find meaningful touch points with our donors when we're not asking them for money all the time? You know, how do we engage them? How do we as staff add value? And I think that's, you know, that's something that we've tried to do is figure out how do we mobilize our our board partners um, on the more annual giving or the, you know, the annual campaign side of things. Um, and this this thank you calling program has been a wonderful way to do that. Um, you know, and then we save our, you know, our, our other, our more um, high level donors, um, you know, to do more of that, um, you know, the, the, the relationship building work and the, the bigger ask work. Well, one thing I've mentioned is that, Lucy, you've talked a lot about uh, making the ask, and I, I generally don't think of it that way. Uh, I think of, of uh, my highest utility is, is building the relation, helping to build a relationship. And then the, if the, if there's a real relationship, the, the, the so-called ask becomes a natural extension of the process. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, uh, so I, I, as you know, I, I really think about it in terms of, of, uh, of the cotton, you know, the, the establishment and continuity and nourishment of the relationship uh, in that um, uh, that's that's key and then the the fundraising just kind of naturally flows from it. Uh, the uh, uh, and I think I, I think uh, people who, board members who have some talent and some inclination to be involved in this work um, will uh, generally be more com comfortable in that mode. The, the other thing I'd say is, um, I think, uh, and I know some of the people you're talking about, Lucy, that that uh, people calling and thanking people, um, uh, I think that's you know particularly effective on the smaller sized donors, but 
but you know, if I get a call from somebody I've never heard of before, and thank and thanks me for a donation to CPM, it's kind of odd for me. Yeah, and I think that's such an important point, Chuck, which is to right size your engagement, right? Um, you know, if someone is giving your organization a thousand dollars, five thousand dollars, and um, they get a call from a, a board member they don't have a relationship with, I think that's that's good. That's okay, right? Yeah. right? But if you know you've got a six figure, seven figure donor, the relationships really start to matter more. Yeah. yeah. All right, we have five minutes. Um, there's one more question in the chat um, that we haven't gotten to yet. Um, so last chance for anybody else to put questions in or just raise your hand. Um, I think we we did start to allude to this a little, but I want to put the question out there anyway, if you want to share any more thoughts. Um, someone asked, what are your philosophies on board give get policies? One of my favorite topics. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chuck, take it away. I, I hate them. <laughs> uh, I find it. Um, I find it kind of offensive, and I find it, um, you know, uh, um, inequitable, um, and I just don't like them. Uh, you know, one board I'm on, uh, one of those fancy boards that I mentioned earlier, they got such a thing, and I object to it. Uh, that uh, you know, if, if you're if you're trying to get compose a board that's representative of your constituency, uh, that uh, uh, you don't want to make people feel like second class citizens on the board. And on the one hand, on the other hand, you don't want a board just populated with rich folks which tends to be an unengaged and boring board that doesn't attract, clearly that doesn't attract people like me. I want to be on a board that's interesting, engaged, uh, diverse, and all of that. And, and the give get thing uh, interrupts that. Uh, and and, and uh, the other thing I'd say is that uh, yeah, I've, I've long believed and I've done reading about this and stuff that you know uh, fundraising at most institutions is highly concentrated dollars are you know a very small number of people give the great bulk of the dollars uh, and uh, you know to to think that that we're going to move the need on fundraising by asking you know a uh, uh, a school superintendent who's on the board to give or get is uh, kind of uh, seems to be. from a tactical perspective. It's my experience has been it's been it ha it's been very hard. Successful board uh, give gets are very difficult um, to achieve. Um, you know, I think people have control over their own giving, and that's where the one-on-one -on -one conversation is really important to understand, you know, both their capacity and their inclination to give and setting a, a, an amount together that makes sense for them. Um, but, you know, to Chuck's, Chuck's earlier point, not everyone has the ability or the desire to fundraise. And I think setting a give get puts pressure on folks in a way that really diminishes their experience. Now, some people are really good at it. And I for those folks, um, go for it, right? But again, I would come back to this notion that for each board member, you really want to have a, a personalized, individualized understanding of where their talents and their interests are along with their capacity to give and and chart a path that way and not try to do a cookie cutter everyone has to give get x dollars a year that also then also artificially puts a ceiling 
um, on yeah. board members who could give more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think I think one of the keys here is that you know with with uh, some degree of subtlety, but not too much, uh, that the board members uh, need to model giving. So the ones who have the capacity to give have to give uh, closer to the capacity to set the tone. Um, and then, you know, that's the way to create a culture of giving, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, Lucy and I have talked about it a little bit that we were a little, seem to be a little shy at, at uh, Chicago Public Media about, um, you know, indicating levels of giving. And so it's, it's apparent to people who, who's doing what, uh, what is giving at what levels. Uh, and uh, and I don't view that uh, just as for self-aggrandizement purposes. I view it for modeling purposes. Uh, so when you're in a campaign at a college, um, you know, there are gift tables. And uh, and then, uh, then, you know, board meetings and other places that people are, are, you know, seeing how the gift tables filled in. And frequently you will, you will, uh, and, and, and various gifts of major sizes will be celebrated. And, uh, and all of that goes to this point about, uh, you know, for those on the board who are able to give at major donor levels, that it, uh, it, it uh, uh, helps to create a culture. Um, so I'll, I'll just stop there. Thank you. Okay, we are over time. So I'm going to let everybody get on with their day. Chuck and Lucy, thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your wisdom and experiences. Um, everybody else, thank you for joining us today. Um, the next convening of the Philanthropy Club will be on July 9th. And the topic is equitable metrics for fundraising departments, which sounds very interesting. Um, so we'll see you all then. Thanks, Have a great everybody. day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.